Well, welcome everyone. Uh, today is March 17th, 2021. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. You can submit your questions on Facebook Live, and we have received some questions ahead of time uh, from wellness at sbhealthcare.org. Uh, the title of our show today is When the Pandemic Hits Home. My guest is one of our most interesting yet. It's Dr. Jennifer Baker Porozinski, uh, who is a family medicine physician at Twin Rivers Medical PC in Hoosick Falls uh, with Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from Alfred University in New York State. And I think I'm supposed to say go Saxons. Is that right, Dr. Baker Porzinski? That's so right. We, uh, she was that's the right. valedictorian of her medical class. Wow, that's pretty awesome. And is it pronounced uh, Poznan University? Yep. Okay. Um, of medical sciences in Poland. Completed a residency with St. Clair's Family Practice Residency Program in Schenectady a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, and she is dual certified uh, by the American Board of Family Medicine and National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. What have you not done, Dr. Baker Porozinski? That's awesome, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here. Um, so tell us a little bit just about where you grew up. I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is kind of a suburb of Philadelphia in an area where farming communities uh, and fam farms that have been in families for generations started to sell for developing uh, plots. So it quickly became kind of more of a suburban area, but when I first moved there, it was kind of like a farm area. Um, I grew up with three sisters in a noisy household. Um, my mom was an RN, which served for me as an ideal model for caregiving. And my dad was a business executive, which is where I got my work ethic and hopefully some of his writing skills. So it was a pretty busy, busy household. That's great. And, and do you go back there frequently? Yeah, one of my sisters still lives in that area. So I do get to visit. I don't know about frequently and certainly not during the pandemic, but sure, maybe once a year I get back. And then, um, so I am supposed to also ask this from some research done by uh, by Ashley, who sets up this program, but she says that there is something called Hot Dog Day at Alfred University. Can you explain that? Hot Dog Day is a super fancy term for family weekend or week, oh. as the sometimes celebration goes on and on. Um, it was started the year I was born, so it's almost 50 years old. Mm. And it was initially, and still is, I believe, they raise money for charities, local charities. Um, hot dog day, actually, it's kind of interesting that you bring it up because it was sort of special in that that was the weekend that my parents met Paul, my future husband, and, um, they met him wearing huge goggles as he joined us for the mud Olympics team. Oh, wow. It was quite messy and fun. So I don't actually remember eating hot dogs, but we probably did. Yeah. And do you have them on your anniversary now? Uh, <laughs> that's great. So, you, you know, um, so back to your training a little bit, you've had uh, a very different medical school experience, I think, than most of your colleagues, or maybe not. Um, but can you just share a little bit about your experience in Poland? Well, I'm sure it was probably pretty different. Um, my husband was born in Poland, and that was part of the reason I went there, although the story how I got there is pretty long. But it was an amazing adventure. Um, my school was the first English language program in Poland. So it was very small. There was about a dozen of us. And my medical school ID number is 0001. So that gives you an idea. Um, it, was a, it was kind of challenging for the medical school because in Poland, school is six years. So they had to figure out how to jam it into a four-year program. But the challenges were more than made up for by the individualized attention we got because it was such a small group. Mm -hmm. And because we were the first group, everyone really wanted us to succeed. So um, one of my fondest memories, which I'm sure is very different from uh, American schooling, and one of my most terrifying memories was taking the final pathology exam at my professor's house where she cooked us, well, she invited us individually. So she cooked me dinner 
and then proceeded to grill me for an hour orally about everything in the Robbins pathology textbook. So, oh goodness. So um, I think it was it was probably pretty different. And then apart from school, of course, uh, there's the cultural aspect. It was quite exciting for me to go there. I I uh, studied anthropology in college, and I was very interested in other cultures. I also wanted to learn some Polish since my husband spoke a lot of Polish to his family and I didn't know what they were saying. And um, we went there at a time where there weren't a lot of Westerners. So we were even outside of the medical school, we were kind of a rarity and people knew us around town. And um, even though we were poor students, American dollar was pretty strong. So we got to do a lot of fun things. We got to travel. So it was, it was overall it was a really pretty fabulous experience. And, and a different one. You are right. That is a different experience. And then is that where you decided when you were doing your time there to go into family medicine? You know, I, I don't have any doctors in my family and all of my own doctors growing up were family doctors. So I really thought that being a doctor meant taking care of everybody. I didn't really actually know that there were other things. I mean, I knew there were special specialties and stuff, but, um, when I started training, I really loved pedi pediatrics, but I didn't think I would be able to handle taking care of really sick kids. And I loved delivering babies, but then I wanted to take care of the newborns. Mm -hmm. And then throughout my training, I, and even now in family medicine, there's such a variety of things that you can do that make every day kind of interesting. So I go to um, the nursing home and I see elderly people. I do home visits occasionally, uh, not so much during the pandemic, but when people are really ill, um, I love taking care of mothers, young mothers who are trying to balance family and home and even middle-aged men who don't want to come to the doctor's office. I like trying to make them feel comfortable. Um, I like being the school physician. I was a school physician when my kids were all in school. So when I found a kid that was in their grade, I'd ask who their teacher was and pass, have them pass secret little notes to my kids in school. So I get to do a lot of different things. And I think that's what I really like about family medicine. Um, also, I always wanted to be a mom, probably mm -hmm. as much, maybe more than I wanted to be a doctor. And family medicine seemed to be uh, a, a field of medicine that appreciates and uh, kind of accepts that people have families. Right. Um, and I did get started right away having a family. I had my first son in uh, medical school and my second one in residency and my third one right after I got out of school. So um by the time I was done my family medicine practice, specialization never even occurred to me because I just had a pretty busy and full life. Right. Well, I think, and I agree with you, I think that most people who are not in healthcare, when they think of, uh, if you said, what does a doctor do? They immediately think of family medicine um, or, or, you know, perhaps an internist and, and pediatrician. And uh, for all those quintessential reasons that, that you mentioned, but then you got interested in integrative uh, medicine. So can you just explain what that is for, um, for our audience and perhaps for me as well? Yeah. So um, because I was busy with a full-time job and three little kids at home, I found that I was kind of stressed. So I started looking for ways to help myself uh, mm -hmm. with stress. And I also injured my knee playing soccer and I couldn't get it to straighten right. So I started to get into yoga to try to fix my knee, which turned out, then I turned out becoming certified as a yoga instructor. And then I got into meditation and I started exercising more and I started to feel better. And I thought, wow, uh, if I could feel better doing some pretty simple things, I'm pretty sure my patients would feel better too. Um, the other thing is that many of my patients were already using alternative type treatments and I wanted them to feel comfortable telling me that they were. And also I wanted to be able to let them know whether I thought it was a good idea or a bad idea, or you know, whether it was safe or effective for what, whatever they were using it for. Um, I also felt like something was missing in what I could give to a lot of my patients, especially people that dealt with a lot of stress, um, with mental health issues or with chronic pain. I wanted to do more than just prescribe drugs and send them to specialists, um, try to get them into mental health, which is not easy. Um, so I started looking for maybe an alternative approach. And I think, I guess that's how I stumbled into integrative medicine. And what integrative medicine is, is it's a combination of conventional medicine, which is what you do and what I do most of the time, 
-hmm. and alternative medicine, which is, you know, looking at things that can help that are maybe um, that are safe and effective um, that you can use in combination with, with your conventional treatment. So for example, with nausea, uh, acupuncture has been used for and been studied to be effective for people who are receiving chemotherapy. So that's a, that's integrative medicine. You're using chemotherapy and acupuncture. And then we use ginger or recommend ginger for pregnant pe people who are nauseous and people who use those C bands when they travel, um, because they get car sickness, that's really pushing on the acupuncture point for nausea. So I think we probably a lot of people use some complementary medicine and don't even realize that they're doing it. Right. That's great. And so in, in your practice, you know, you said you mostly are practicing conventional, but I imagine that you don't see a patient say, Oh, I'm going to do integrative medicine on you. I, I'm certain that the word integrative means that you're doing the same thing for all patients and some, maybe some ratio, uh, depending on what their issue is. Yeah, I would say it's mostly conventional medicine and where integrative medicine, my training helped is to give me a broader perspective of treating patients. So integrative medicine believes in a lot in prevention and in using um, more natural, less expensive, less invasive, invasive treatments. So it's holistic in that it it talks about treating the mind, body, and spirit. And spirit was something I never heard of treating in um, conventional, in my conventional training. So basically it's trying to consider the whole story when a patient comes in. So for example, if somebody comes in with a headache, I mean, not a headache with, um, let's say insomnia, mm -hmm. I can give them a drug to help them sleep, but usually insomnia is a symptom of something else. They're stressed, they're abusing substances They're And so treating the underlying stress, um, through, you know, exercise and meditation and, you know, more basic things is probably more effective and better in the long run than just giving them a pill to help them sleep. <laughs> well, that's so in your practice, then, um, what you set yourself up well for, so what gives you then the, the most pleasure in your, in your medical career? Are you running the practice like you envisioned? Um, yes and no. It's, it's challenging, of course, for everybody because of the time aspect. But um, I think one part of uh, integrative medicine that I really do, that really brings out the joy in medicine for me is taking the time to hear the patient's story. So I really get a lot of uh, joy hearing, you know, what a person is like outside of the office. And um, I actually am writing a memoir, which includes a lot of patient stories in it, because they're probably my best teacher. Um, the other thing I like, of course, about medicine, and I think all doctors do is the satisfaction of um, helping people, whether it's prescribing a drug for their diabetes, so that hopefully they live longer or have a, you know, better life, or hugging my lonely older patients, um, or crying with somebody who's grieving, I get a lot of satisfaction from being with my patients. Um, I'm not sure I answered your question. No, that's great. And we just can't wait to have you back um, once your memoir is complete. It kind of reminds <laughs> me of, of the David Lobster Camp um, uh, books that he's written about practicing in Maine as a family medicine yeah. physician. And um, and I, I believe I said his last name correctly, but anyway, I look forward to that. And I look forward to having you back here or at least sitting down and, and chatting with you on it. That's, that's awesome. Uh, and inspirational at that. Well, you know, one of the reasons uh, that we had asked you to come on this show besides uh, learning your background and all the incredibly interesting uh, things you're doing in your practice in our system is this uh, situation that happened with one of your family members who had a real personal brush with COVID-19. Um, so I'm just going to kind of open it up and let you uh, describe that and say that you you actually wrote about this and, and uh, somewhat published your uh, experience with uh, with your husband. Yeah. So um, Christmas week, my husband got a phone call from his father saying, asking for his help. His mom was really ill with a fever and cough, and she had just gotten out of the hospital and they couldn't get her down the stairs to go to the doctors to get tested and to get checked. So of course we went uh, to help her. And um, Paul insisted that I stay in the parking lot because he knew I took care of a lot of people and he didn't want me to be exposed just in case. Although I think we were both a little bit in denial at initially that that was what was going on. Um, he masked, he wore gloves, he 
tried to be careful. He helped her down to the car. And um, when she got down outside of the house, she hesitated when she was stepping over the curb. And I rushed over to help because she just looked so frail. Mm -hmm. Paul put his hand up and said, you know, I got this. We're okay. And I was really glad that I was wearing sunglasses. So she couldn't see that I was crying because Mm -hmm. she looked so frail to me that I just knew when I saw her that she was really sick and I worried she was positive and Mm -hmm. that she might not make it. So that was Christmas week. And then the day after Christmas, Paul started to feel a little sick and got tested and Christmas, the day after Christmas, both Paul and my son, uh, my youngest son, Orion tested positive. Um, but he didn't have any symptoms. So. But Paul did. Yeah. Paul was really sick. Um, Paul basically had every symptom that you could have. Uh, he had fevers to 104 for three weeks, even with ibuprofen and Tylenol around the clock. He got pneumonia and needed antibiotics and prednisone and inhalers and eventually oxygen. Uh, he couldn't keep anything down. So we took him to the ER one night for, um, we, I took him to the ER one night for IV fluids. Uh, he was in bed for almost three weeks. He was very weak and tired. If you don't mind me asking, um, how old is your husband? How old is Paul? 53. So. And does he, does he have, so he's young. Does he have um, what we call comorbidities in medicine? No. Do you have other illnesses? <clears throat> No, he's, um, he, he's basically healthy. We're very active. We do a lot of outdoor activities. Um, he did not have any of the, the major comorbidities. No, right. so that's why it was so shocking. He actually was, and his mom did. <laughs> he actually was a lot, ended up being a lot sicker than his mom. And I think that's part of, um, I, I wouldn't call it a fallacy because it is true that those that are older and have uh, other illnesses uh, do much worse with COVID-19. But what is a fallacy is that therefore the flip, if you're young and healthy, you won't have a problem. Um, And that's just not the case for for certain individuals as you experienced. And you have sort of an advantage, uh, not sort of, you have a big advantage being a doctor and trying to care for him at home. So I guess my first question is, what was that like uh, for you? you? You had to continue to work. Um, you had a family to take care of. Yeah. So uh, for in the beginning, I tried to work and it wasn't super hard to ignore him because he basically spent the whole day in the bedroom with the lights off and I didn't really have to do anything. He was just really sick. And I thought, but I thought, okay, he's sick. He just needs to rest and he'll get better. So I tried to work and um, working from my house is a challenge anyway, because I have terrible internet really no internet. So I was using a hotspot on my phone and I was upstairs because that's closest to our cell phone booster, which is mounted on our roof. It's complicated. Right. And it's still terrible. But anyway, I I had noise cancellation headphones on, so I didn't really hear things. And at the end of the day, I took them off and I heard just this spastic, unremitting coughing coming from downstairs that that I hadn't heard because I was working. And I took off my headphones and I ran downstairs and my husband looked horrible. He was just pale and weak and short of breath. And I was thinking like, what am I doing? And and it still didn't occur to me like not to work actually until I called my mother that night to just let her know how we were. And I burst into tears and she was like, what you, you have to stop working. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's a really good idea. So um, it was, partly because of my caregiving mother that I was realized like, I can't work and then check in on him. And I I just need to be around. And plus it was really complicated. His regimen, he took almost 40 pills a day Mm. between all those different antibiotics and ibuprofen and the Tylenol and the prednisone and, you know, guifenesin. And it just took so many drugs that I think there, therein lies some of the advantage of having, uh, you know, being a medical person, I actually made a spreadsheet because it was so complicated. Something should be taken with food and something shouldn't. And he couldn't remember what he took. So I just took over and would come in every hour and be like, okay, it's time for these three. It's time for these two. It's time for, you know, I wanted to make sure he completed the antibiotic course. He didn't miss anything. So that was a benefit of being a doctor. And another benefit of course, is I had a stethoscope. So I listened to his lungs and I knew he had pneumonia. Um, And um, 
that I called his doctor and, and got him started on antibiotics. I had, we had a blood pressure cuff, so I could kind of, and I had the knowledge to know when to panic and when to reassure, like, no, you're okay. I know you feel terrible, but you're going to be okay. Um, I also had the advantage of great colleagues. Um, my work was wonderful. I texted you a couple times. I texted, texted Dr. George a few times. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Schwartz is my husband's doctor and he arranged for him to get oxygen delivered on a bitter cold night uh, on Friday mm -hmm. evening at 10 a.m. Uh, 10 p.m. They delivered oxygen to my house and he also contacted me regularly to just check in and see how things were. So I definitely had a lot of advantages, but I also think I may have some disadvantages. I, I wrote a piece a while back called not lucky to have a doctor in the family because <laughs> I think in my family, at least, it's probably different for yours, Trey, but in my family, um, when there's a family emergency, my husband's the doctor. I just, when my kids get sick or hurt, I will be on the floor crying and he will take over. And I think a lot of times I don't, you know, you don't examine a family member. You don't take the same, ask the same questions necessarily. You don't think of the same differential diagnoses as you might do with a right. patient. So there are advantages and disadvantages. Right. We certainly, uh, as physicians, cannot also be patients for family members. It just does not work. And most of us learn that really early. Um, and, you know, just to reiterate what we started off this discussion uh, pretty quickly or got into it is this, this notion that some people believe uh, COVID-19 is really not that bad of a disease or, or it only affects people that are at the end of life. And, and your example um, you know, the last time I saw your husband, he was out hiking to um, Little Pond and, and certainly didn't look like anyone who needed any assistance from any, you know, from anything. So, um, and that's also what we see as our patients, what you see in your office, what I see in the emergency department. And we just really need the public to understand that the, the disease, you know, right now, it, um, there's so much good news with vaccine uh, and de declining case numbers. Uh, but we have to continue all the mitigation until we can get that population vaccinated to a certain degree uh, that we are safe because it can happen today. I don't think people realize that uh, they, for some reason, either never believed it before, they think it's gone. And, um, you know, your husband, unfortunately, uh, was really ill. Now, now, the real question is, how is he doing today? So I feel very blessed <laughs> that he is, I think, totally fine today. Um, so I do know though, that uh, there are patients of mine who don't believe in the severity and, or who are worried about the vaccines. And I, I, in those patients, I do bring him up as an example, but I'm lucky because he's not one of those uh, people that has prolonged unremitting symptoms. He, he is fine, but I don't do it to scare people. I, right. I also tell them my son also had it and had no symptoms. Sure. Um, but protecting our community, our family, and our you, you, in my case, our patients, I mean, that's why we have to keep the mitigation efforts up. That's why we should get vaccinated. That's why we need to wear masks and keep the public, dis, you know, the social distancing, um, because it, it really can happen to anyone. We were very careful and, you know, we got sick. So even people without risk factors can get very ill. Absolutely. You know, um, actually, just to throw in another story, my... My son, um, who is 17, just told me about one of his friends who got COVID back in November. And even though he didn't have, his symptoms were, were pretty mild. He had a cough for a week or so. Um, he's a, a competitive skier, this friend, and he can't competitively ski. He hasn't been able to ski on the team since he got COVID because he gets really uh, winded fast and, um, and it's related to the disease. And hopefully he's improving over time. Um, and again, like you, it's a balance, not trying to scare people, just say, hey, this is real. Um, let's stick with what we've got. Let's get everyone vaccinated as much as possible. Um, what, do you, do you, with your patients now, do you feel that this experience has given you um, a different perspective? I, mean, I imagine it has. Yeah. Yeah, it really has. When people, when I have to call somebody to tell them they're positive, I am so much more aware of what that really means or what it mm -hmm. could mean. You know, and when I call people to reassure them when I'm on call over the weekend and I've called people, I probably spend a lot more time on the phone than maybe I would have been, you know, in the past thinking, oh, they'll be fine. Just, I mean, sometimes they just need reassurance. People get really afraid when they hear it. And there are 
you know, there are times when I tell people, you really need to go to the ER. You, you, you sound short of breath. This is not something to mess around with. So, yeah, I think it, it really has changed uh, how I see patients in the office, but also how I talk to people on the phone, positive or negative. That's great. Well, turning towards a positive uh, outlook then in this regard, you know, we actually have over 75% uh, of those that are uh, 75 and older in the country are, are now vaccinated. We're approaching two thirds of those that are 65 and above, um, which is incredible numbers, which are incredible numbers that we need to rejoice in and keep that momentum going. Uh, to get the rest of the country vaccinated. If we can approach that 70%, you know, there's all these different numbers, 70, 80, 95%, but we can go towards that goal of 70% of the country uh, by the early summer as the CDC, uh, our, our president and our governor uh, of many states talk about, then we can drop a lot of the mitigation. But if we do it now, uh, we risk some, some serious illness. So I was just going to finish with what are you most excited to do uh, once uh, mitigation measures like distancing and masks um, when, when the restrictions are lifted? Uh, I think two things. I'm, I'm most excited to begin traveling again. I, I really miss my sisters. I really miss my parents. Um, I usually go down to Florida to see them during spring break, which didn't happen this year. Uh, my husband and I have been working on our sailing certification, so I'm hoping we can sail to places, maybe even up to Montreal, and actually get out of the boat and see places. Um, so I'm mostly excited about traveling and seeing friends and family. No, that's really exciting. I wish I had, I'm going to come up with some good plans like that. That's <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining us today on Medical Matters Weekly. I'd like to once again thank our guest, Dr. Baker Porzinski from Twin Rivers Medical in Hoosick. Uh, as well as Mike Cutler from CAT TV, uh, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Jowett also from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Uh, go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and see you next week.